um, it's my great pleasure to be here and I have been very much enjoying um, the conversations I've been having with people and the presentations that I've been to so far. And I'm very grateful to Sue for introducing um, this conference to me. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's very difficult when you are preparing a presentation and you're not quite sure of the audience that you're going to be talking to. So I do hope that I have pitched it right for you. Um, and I hope that uh, some of the things I say will be able to be translated to your own context because we very much do, don't we, live within our own context. Um, I'm going to be talking about this concept of social mobility in higher education and, and I don't know how well that is a, an issue in, in uh, different parts of the world but certainly in the UK the term social mobility and actually let me say upward social mobility um, is actually what uh, uh, exercises people uh, quite considerably um, in the UK. Um, and the role of higher education and how higher education can or can't create upward social mobility. Um, uh, so there's been quite a bit of work done on that and I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, what that means uh, for us in terms of our practice. I hope what I'm going to be saying will um, dovetail quite nicely with, with uh, Sue's tour de force that we, we had uh, earlier this morning. Okay, right, fantastic, got there. Um, uh, and like Sue, I, I thought um, I would just start with a little bit of kind of context, um, both bigger context, but starting much more personally in terms of my own context. Um, I grew up in South Africa. I was born in Cape Town. Um, in the late 1950s and um, as a result of that I grew up through the apartheid era. My father, um, uh, who was also born in South Africa, left school at the age of 12 because his dad died and he was the oldest child and had to look after the farm. Um, so he didn't get an education. Um, and he ended up being the secretary to the printers' trade union in South Africa, which was the first trade union in South Africa to have black members. So my childhood was very much um, filled with political debate, discussion, uh, and, and lots of kinds of learning that uh, I wasn't getting at school. Um, and that, I think, was terribly important to me. My father really believed in education and felt it was very important that his children got an education, even me, his daughter. And I can remember him saying to me, well, you can always train as a teacher because then you'll have the holidays to look after your children. <laughs> so his, his vision for me was much greater than the women of his generation. But I think he would be quite amazed if he was here today to see me ending up being a vice chancellor. Um, but he did believe that I needed to get an education. I, of course, was quite a rebellious child and decided that I was going to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I trained as an actor and my first year at drama school in South Africa was 1976 and for those of you who know something about the South African um, history, that was an absolute baptism of fire. Drama schools in South Africa were multiracial. Um, the apartheid government was too mean to have separate drama schools for black and Asian uh, students because there were few of them. So uh, we were actually multiracial and 76 was when the townships exploded when um, uh, uh, Steve Biko was, was uh, terribly important and hugely influential in my life. Uh, and I had to make choices about what I did and what I didn't do. So I think I did an awful lot of learning outside of education rather than inside of it. So that's the kind of context that uh, my talk has for you today, that actually learning is beyond the classroom. Um, and those life experiences have really impacted on 
the way I operate as a researcher, as an educator, and now as a senior manager in, in higher education. I think it's also important that we don't just think about ourselves, but we think about the wider context. And at a conference where we're looking at education in, in the broadest context, I think even though I'm going to be talking about higher education, I think we do need to look at a global perspective on these things and to recognize that in, in many countries, access to any education at all is still a challenge. Um, and in, in the UK, we talk a lot about access to higher education because um, we have a very good primary and secondary education system. And although there are faults with it, it is a very good primary and secondary education system. So I, I, I just want to put that context even though I'm talking about higher education. And Sue talked quite a bit about this issue of, of the economic um, and the entire focus around the economic. And while I think it is important that we uh, recognize that if you come from a poorer background, actually being able to access economic success in some shape or form is not something that should be denied. And I think middle class people sometimes focus, uh, don't recognize that fully. Um, actually, that's where I think upward social mobility is important and actually something we need to take account of. Um, better economic outcomes for people in, in the poorest backgrounds in any country has to be a goal that we uh, accept and believe in. But higher education is now um, a, a, a worldwide phenomenon. And actually, when you start to look at the numbers of people in higher education, it is no longer, in many countries, something that is an elite system. Increasingly, it's a mass and even a global system. Um, and so I think it requires more study, more analysis, partly because of that. And that's what I've uh, been doing for the last few years. I started my research in the field of lifelong learning, but I have to say I have moved into looking at higher education studies, partly because it's the day job. Um, and I think, for me, a lot of my own uh, research, I am a sociologist, um, so apologies to those of you who think sociologists are terrible creatures. Um, but, but for me, uh, Sue also talked about the dominance of neoliberal theory um, and uh, uh, particularly uh, in, in the West, but uh, across the globe too. For me, a term that I'm going to talk quite a lot about is this idea of choice. What choice is, and, and matters of taste. Because within neoliberalism, choice is probably at the heart of a neoliberal theory. Choice is what is almost equated with freedom. And I think we have to deconstruct this notion of choice. Because I think that choice is not simply about us being able to make choices. There are all sorts of constraints and challenges around the idea of choice. And the quote I have here is um, from a, uh, a, a, another sociologist in the UK, Diana Ray, who talks about this question of choice of what university you go to, and indeed the choices that you make once you're in higher education, are about a choice of lifestyle and a matter of taste. And that social class has, is a key aspect to the subtext of choice. That these things don't operate in isolation. That the choices we make are constrained by the experiences we've had and the social, economic, and cultural background that we come from. So this question of social mobility, as I say, is exercising people in the United Kingdom enormously. And last year, 
under the previous regime, uh, under New Labour in the UK. Um, one of the ministers, a chap called Alan Milburn, um, uh, held a committee which uh, produced a report on social mobility and access to the professions. And the research that they did showed that those people who were born in the 1958 cohort, and I'll admit, that's my cohort, so you can work out how old I am. <laughs> um, those who were born in the 58 cohort had a strong upward trajectory. Um, but those who were born in the 1970s cohort, that actually had flattened off. Now, Methodologically, you could say all sorts of things about the difference in terms of that, because people who were born in the 1970s are heading into 40, and with lifelong learning, you might actually see some of those people still progress. But it is interesting to see that things are flattened off. But more interesting for me is the second bit of information. 75% of judges in the UK, 70% of finance directors, 45% of top civil servants, 32% of members of parliament went to private education. In a country where we have, as I said before, an incredibly good public system of education. And the reason why it's kind of connected with higher education is that graduate employment when people have completed their degree, they're far more likely to have access into the professions. And I'm not just going to talk about employment, but this is interesting, from the Milburn report. Employers said they found it increasingly hard to fill graduate vacancies because students failed to match the academic achievement that they had with leadership, teamworking, and communication skills. Now, isn't that interesting? When we were just talking earlier um, with Sue about how we are focusing down on skills, 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 but those softer um, emotional intelligence type things, things that you pick up in a wide variety of different contexts, actually, ultimately, the employers would say that's what they were looking for. And this, I think, is really quite interesting, is that those, there's not much research done in the UK. There's most of the research around extracurricular activities or things that go on beyond the classroom comes from the USA. And what they found in their research is that young people tend to develop those kinds of skills through things outside of the classroom, not...